the fair winds blow Our home is where the waters flow We'll show you what we've come to know On board while sailing wisdom morning, very early morning in Georgetown and we are headed into the Wakama. We've been here for a few days and we've really enjoyed it. As usual, time to move on and we're just, we're really excited about the Wakama because it was our favorite part of the ICW coming down. Our favorite town was Charleston and our favorite ICW stretch was the Wakama and I think you're gonna see why. Anchors up! Anchors up! <laughs> Another night, I fall in your sight Your new eyes cut sharp like a knife Take a moment and look all around you I don't want you caught off guard or along with I come for you, I need you to know that I would never walk away I know what you need Wakama River was our favorite part. It, it's we We're coming through all the shallow parts in North Carolina, running aground every day at low tide. Like it, That part was just miserable. And then we got to the Wakama and everywhere is like 20 to 30 feet deep. It's wide. It's gorgeous. It's just, it's a whole nother world. Like there's no palm trees or beaches or any of that stuff. It's just otherworldly. There's these really cool trees that just come out of the water and you can anchor right next to it because it's like 20 feet deep right at the tree it's just oh, it's magical here i just i'm so excited to be in the wakama again it's dawn we're going to be raising anchor and we're going to be going with the very slight current north so the wakama flows south if you're coming through the wakama it's much easier to go south because it's flowing faster and longer heading south uh, if you're going north there's a small window when it's flowing north uh, so we're gonna get the anchor up and drift along with the current motor along nice and quietly and just enjoy the nature Last night we anchored halfway to our destination this morning. We are going the rest of the way Herbie took Morty to shore and now we are headed continuing up the Wakama. It is such a beautiful river we're headed to a marina because Herbie now needs to go back to Baltimore this weekend to move Windpuff. Windpuff is our Allberg 30, our other boat. 
and wind puff needs to get out of the merino where it currently resides so herbie's gonna go and move that i'm gonna stay here and hold down the fort we're coming up on our wakawachi marina here and in order to prep for that herbie just got out all of the dock lines and the fenders we're gonna be doing a starboard tie up and uh it's just been a really really beautiful day there is a big hawk big hawk okay guys a little sneak peek at something that's coming soon it's our next project for when we get back to the chesapeake that guy we're gonna make that boat and ocean going cruiser on the tightest of budgets ever. So it's a bit of an annoying situation. We left this boat here on the hard when we went out to go cruising and the marina's decided that it's been here long enough it has to leave right now. Not in one to two months when we actually get back to the Chesapeake. No motor. We have a sculling oar. Hopefully the oar hasn't rotted because it's been about five years. So you might be wondering hey what if I get like free abandoned boat from Craigslist or super cheap because it's you know in this kind of shape what's it gonna take to bring that boat back what's it gonna take to make it happen can it be done that is what we're gonna be doing here that's what we're gonna be showing you guys how to do so this is Windpuff she's an Auberg 30 from 1966 and uh, we're gonna take a little tour on the hall it looks like acne scars got some gouges up here on the bow area probably ran into a pier a little bit it's missing a screw Okay, in the cockpit we have tiller steering, got a lazarette back here, it's got some storage in it, mm-hmm, big hole, yep, some storage on the side, and this is a cool feature, access to the icebox. That way while you're sailing and you feel a little parched, you can just grab something without bothering anyone or going inside. Alright, going forward we got the sloop rig, oh, a serious thing, if you're buying a boat near Maryland, Watch for these guys. Got roller furling for now. An anchor securely mounted on the bow here. Very nice, very nice. And one chalk. The other chalk seems to be missing. Fridge. It's uh, needing some good TLC in there. Just gonna close that for now. That's supposed to be the galley. Lots of funky stuff. Yep, we're gonna have our work cut out. A lovely head. Mm, everyone would like to do stuff in there. And then up front, you got the V berth with uh, some sails, some life jackets, and a whole lot of funk happening up here. Mm. And then behind that curtain is the chain locker area. I'm kind of scared to see what's in there. Oh, so if you notice how you can see light through, that's because this boat is not a cord hull, it's solid fiberglass. No matter how thick you make the fiberglass, you'll see light through. It's like that weird reddish color. It's a little uh, unnerving when you see it the first time because you're like, oh my God, is this paper thin? But no, it's it's pretty thick, at least on ours. I'm not sure how thick this boat is, but we'll find that out when we start putting through hulls in. So guys, let me know what on earth it is. There's this like goopy stuff that's dripping down. And it come, it's wherever a horizontal meets a vertical, it drips out of there. And I can't smell anything on it, but I also can't smell too well. So maybe it does have an odor. It feels like molasses. I haven't tasted it because it looks disgusting and I'm not going to do that. Uh, what is the stuff? And uh, it's gross. here so I need to scull. Thankfully there's no wind. So we're gonna get the sculling oar ready. That guy right there. And get us moving.
I started going backwards with the current, went right into a police boat slip, so I uh, couldn't stay there. And I tried walking, like piling the piling, and the marina finally gave in, and <laughs> so now I'm getting towed. This is a pretty interesting experience. So when we were in Spain, they told us you have to get the boat out of here. Apparently the marina changed owners and they were getting rid of all the boats that had been here for a long time, which cool. They're trying to improve the marina and all that's that's always a, a noble thing to do. But we were paying our slip. Like we were paying to be here and then they said, nope, have to move it. We're not gonna renew the lease. And I explained to them, I'm in Spain. I cannot get there to move the boat. So they wouldn't take payment for a year and then at the end of the year then they did some legal stuff and then finally we're like hey if you just pay for the year the legal problem goes away i'm like thank you that's what i've been trying to do for a year they never answer phone calls they don't answer emails it's just been a nightmare and then i asked them about renewing the slip for another year because we weren't back yet and they're like nope no can do the boat has to be gone april 1st i'm like okay so I get here April 1st, the boat's boxed in, they're like, can't move you, we'll let you know when. And they let me know when, when we were in Charleston, like literally, we just drove back to the boat, we just got home, and they're like, come move your boat now. I'm like, guys. So, anyway, I come up this weekend because this weekend had no wind, and it was you know, nice and easy. So I came up here, we launched the boat, they wouldn't give me a tow they said they didn't have a work barge all that mess they saw me struggling with the oar and just apparently got some kindness in their heart and came over with a work barge that they said they didn't have and gave me a tow to the t-head of the field dock now tomorrow my dad's gonna come and uh tow me the rest of the way and we're gonna take it to harrington harbor where we're gonna haul it out there i'm glad we're leaving because it's nice to be in a place where you're wanted so you guys might remember that time that we had a little bit of a poo-poo situation with our bilge water where the bilge flooded and just made a mess. So I'm going to show you guys a little thing that I do now, now that I know better, to make sure that never happens again. You take a float switch, you go to West Marine, and you pay all of your money and you buy a pump as well, and you hook it onto a rod. And that's it. So I'm just going to assemble this with a hose clamp and then we will have a bilge pump that we can just stick in somewhere and have it run because we just put this boat in the water and I don't want it to sink while we're away because we're not back in Maryland yet and it's going to be sitting in a slip for about a month before we can haul it out again. So we're going to have solar panel powering the pump, just making everything be good. Okay, the setup's really simple. This is your pump. This is your float switch. You're going to wire them together and you're going to attach everything onto a rod. This rod lets you put it down into the bilge, wherever it is, and then from like really high up, you can pull it back up and check on it, work on it, do whatever you want. This is really good when you have an old boat with a full keel and a really deep bilge. You just can't reach down there. And trying to like mount the float switch and mount the bilge pump down there, it's just, it's such a pain. So with this rod, it's not such a pain. So you want to mount the float switch a little higher than the pump, that way the pump will shut off, because otherwise the float switch tells it to keep pumping until it's dry. But it just can't physically do that. So on our boat, I normally do this part with seizing wire, because you can put it right up next to it and hold it nice and tight. I just don't have any seizing wire in the Auberg, because I didn't bring any. Now, these pumps, you can wire them so that you have the switch manual automatic. With this setup, you don't it's just automatic okay and with that you have your setup you got the float switch on one side pump on the other it sits on the bottom water comes in it runs turns off naturally the wires you know go up to the top here that way they're not in the water and all that fun stuff but yeah this is this is what we're gonna just drop down into the bilge now for right now i have a hose set very lovely just down the middle of the boat and it comes out the hoss pipe for the anchor road because that was a hole that was in the boat already that I could fit the giant hose through. So it's just gonna run from the bilge up through there and then over the side. All 
right, we're under tow. We're uh, about two and a half hours, we'll get the deal. We're gonna tie up there and it's, uh, it's pretty smooth and awesome. We're going when there is like absolutely no weather at all, which is why I drove up. And it's perfect because it's the weekend, so my dad's not working, so he's able to give me a tow and it's just working out really well. So I'm super excited to get down the deal. We're going 7.1 knots. So I got blinded by the situation. I was like, all right, we are plugged in, 100% charge. The only kind of downside of Hank on sales is that now we're about to embark in a bit of a more challenging section of our journey. I was just wondering how much of a difference has it made being electric and charging from the sun versus if we stayed diesel and just went with that? Like how many gallons of diesel have we not burned? Thanks for watching this episode of Sailing Wisdom. Don't forget to like the video, share it with your friends, and hit subscribe so you don't miss the next Rigging Doctor episode. And if you're interested in even more Rigging Doctor awesomeness, consider becoming a patron to see all of our extras. Can't wait to see you next time as you join us out here on the high seas.